What is truth? was an inquiry many ages since, and it being that which all mankind either do or pretend to search after, it cannot but be worth our while carefully to examine wherein it consists, and so acquainting ourselves with the nature of it, as to observe how the mind distinguishes it from falsehood. Truth, then, seems to me, in the proper import of the word, to signify nothing but the joining or separating of signs, as the things signified by them do agree or disagree one with another. The joining or separating of signs here meant is what by another name we call proposition, so that truth properly belongs only to propositions, whereof there are two sorts, viz. mental and verbal, as there are two sorts of signs commonly made use of, viz. ideas and words. The empire of the supernatural must obviously be most extended where civilization is the least advanced. An educated man has to make a conscious and sometimes severe effort to refrain from pronouncing a dogmatic opinion as to the cause of the given result when sufficient evidence to warrant a definite conclusion is wanting. To the savage, the notion of any necessity for or advantage to be derived from such self-restraint never once occurs. Neither the lightning that strikes his hut, the blight that withers his crops, the disease that destroys the life of those he loves, nor, on the other hand, the beneficent sunshine or life-giving rain, is by him traceable to any known physical cause. They are the results of influences utterly beyond his understanding, supernatural, matters upon which imagination is allowed free scope to run riot, and from which spring up a legion of myths, or attempts to represent in some manner these incomprehensible processes, grotesque or poetic, according to the character of the people with which they originate, which, if their growth be not disturbed by extraneous influences, eventually develop into the national creed. To form a clear notion of truth, it is very necessary to consider truth of thought and truth of words, distinctly one from another, but yet it is very difficult to treat of them asunder, because it is unavoidable in treating of mental propositions to make use of words, and then the instances given of mental propositions cease immediately to be barely mental and become verbal. For a mental proposition, being nothing but a bare consideration of the ideas, as they are in our minds, stripped of names, they lose the nature of purely mental propositions as soon as they are put into words. The most ordinary events of the savage's everyday life do not admit of a natural solution. His whole existence is bound in, from birth to death, by a network of miracles, and regulated in its smallest details by unseen powers of whom he knows little or nothing. Hence it is that in primitive societies, the functions of legislator, judge, priest, and medicine man are all combined in one individual, the great medium of communication between man and the unknown, whose person is preeminently sacred. The laws that are to guide the community come in some mysterious manner through him from the higher powers. If two members of the clan are involved in a quarrel, he is appealed to to apply some test in order to ascertain which of the two is in the wrong, an ordeal that can have no judicial operation except on the assumption of the existence of omnipotent beings interested in the discovery of evildoers, who will prevent the test from operating unjustly.
judgmental propositions are very hard to be treated of, and that which makes it yet harder to treat of mental and verbal propositions separately is that most men, if not all, in their thinking and reasonings within themselves, make use of words instead of ideas, at least when the subject of their meditation contains in it complex ideas which is a great evidence of the imperfection and uncertainty of our ideas of that kind, and may, if attentively made use of, serve for a mark to show us what are those things we have clear and perfect established ideas of, and what not. For if we will curiously observe the way our mind takes in thinking and reasoning, we shall find, I suppose, that when we make any propositions within our own thoughts, about white or black, sweet or bitter, a triangle or a circle, we can, and often do, frame in our minds the ideas themselves, without reflecting on the names. Melodies and famines are unmistakable signs of the displeasure of the good or spite of the bad spirits and are to be averted by some propitiatory act on the part of the sufferers or the mediation of the priest doctor. The remedy that would put an end to a long continued drought will be equally effective in arresting an epidemic. But who and of what nature are these supernatural powers whose influences are thus brought to bear upon everyday life and who appear to take such an interest in the affairs of mankind? It seems that there are three great principles at work in the evolution and modification of the ideas upon this subject, which must now be shortly stated. The first of these is the apparent incapacity of the majority of mankind to accept a purely monotheistic creed. But when we would consider or make propositions about the more complex ideas, as of a man, vitriol, fortitude, glory, we usually put the name for the idea, because the ideas these names stand for, being for the most part imperfect, confused and undetermined, we reflect on the names themselves, because they are more clear, certain and distinct, and readier occur to our thoughts than the pure ideas. And so we make use of these words instead of the ideas themselves, even when we would meditate and reason within ourselves and make tacit mental propositions. It is a demonstrable fact that the primitive religions now open to observation attribute specific events and results to distinct supernatural beings, and there can be little doubt that this is the initial step in every creed. It is a bold and somewhat perilous revolution to attempt to overturn this doctrine and to set up monotheism in its place, and when successfully accomplished, is rarely permanent. The more educated portions of the community maintain allegiance to the new teaching, perhaps, but among the lower classes, it soon becomes degraded to, or amalgamated with, some form of polytheism more or less pronounced, and either secret or declared. Even the Jews, the nation the most conspicuous for its supposed uncompromising adherence to a monotheistic creed, cannot claim absolute freedom from taint in this respect. For in the country places, far from the center of worship, the people were constantly following after strange gods, and even some of their most notable worthies were liable to the same accusation. <laughs> 